my name is Fairleth Harvey. I'm a freelance artist and immersive experience designer, and uh, my pronouns are she, her. I have had the same focus since I was five years old. I grew up in uh, Chilliwack in the North Vancouver, and I saw a production of The Mikado, and of course that's canceled now, but I was five, so... Um, and I was really, really taken by it. I had undiagnosed ADHD until I was about 30 years old, and theater was the one place where I could focus. I was enraptured. I started full-time dance then when I was six, and I went all the way to theater school in New York, where I became, became immediately disillusioned with what live theater is. I studied musical theater at AMDA, the American Musical and Dramatic Academy. I was always given roles of women who were either desperate or unattractive or both. And that wasn't how I saw myself, and I didn't appreciate being told by adults when I was 18 years old that I had to be the unattractive, funny one for life, and I just rejected it. Um, the most valuable thing I learned at that school was make your own work, so I started, and I've never looked back. I stopped auditioning. I haven't auditioned for anything, um, except for the very occasional I need to do that project since, I think, 2008. Which is not to say I don't hold audi auditions, but I think I hold them in a way that is supportive and kind and doesn't make people feel terrible. I wanted to create a safe space where people could try um, safely to see if they could, you know, measure up to their dreams of who they were. A place where if people auditioned, they got to say what they wanted to do, who they saw themselves as. So when I got back from AMDA and I started thinking about um, becoming an artist, a self a self-producing artist, I came up with a 10-year plan, and that was starting uh, with club nights, Batman theme club night, Doctor Who theme club night, and I put on theme music, I'd work really hard on it, but uh, we'd also do an hour-long variety show. The host would be in character, I would write a script, we'd have acts in character, and people started to get familiar with my writing. So then I started to put on full-length burlesque musicals, because people wanted the burlesque gimmick, but you know, I'd put on Star Wars theme burlesque, and people would arrive, and it was a full musical, but I didn't tell them, and I didn't charge as if it was a full musical. I was really into like surprising people, especially people who didn't have enough budget to maybe go to Broadway across Canada, but then they'd be surprised by a really high quality show. After that, um, I started putting instead of burlesque musicals, parody musicals, and uh, so on and so forth until people trusted my original immersive shows and original plays. I started Geeks After Dark in 2009. And I started that as a as a club night. The idea was to get people who identified as nerds out of the house and seeing live theater, and they really resonated with it. That went on for a while, and I thought the club night model was a little restrictive. And uh, then I started partnering with other theaters, and I, I wanted to find a, a name that was less exclusionary of people under 18. But I think it's really important for people to feel like there is an avenue for them if they are neurodivergent, if they don't have the ability to go to New York to study musical theater. I recognize how privileged I am, and I, I wanted to pass it on a little bit. I'm at a point in my life where I am too disabled to be able to run a theater company full time because I'm very lucky. The Geek Enders exploded so much. Over 150,000 people saw the shows live, so it's like I'm so sad to leave, but also like. I know that it's still going and I know it's still a safe place for people and I'm really proud and I'm happy. I have been diagnosed just as of this past August 2023 with uh, fibromyalgia and it's still hard for me to pronounce myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm trying to learn the scientific version because people don't believe it exists. The difficulty with people not believing it exists is I know that I used to work 80 hours a week and I know that growing up I spent 20 years as a full-time dancer dancing six to seven days a week. So I know that if I could be, I would be doing that stuff. And now I have to take a rest if I work one four hour shift for a whole day, I have to rest. Um, if I have to run for the ferry, I'm done for the rest of the day like it's awful it's not that I mind I'm 35 and I knew my dance career would come to an end but it's it's very surreal to have people around me not believing I'm I've been disabled even though I'm mourning this immense amount of activity when I was subscribing to hustle culture I was going too fast and trying to do too much to focus on the parts of being an artist that I actually liked so I'm trying to think of this as a gift from faint that now I have to slow down and practice writing jokes. I'm still struggling with finding an adequate label for what I like to do. I guess I call myself an artist because I like to think of myself as like facilitating collaboration, but my favorite thing to do is write, and I like to write comedy. 
My absolute idol in the world is Jim Henson. Not only was he a proponent of leave the world a little better than you found it, but he did not set out to become a puppeteer. He was in love with television. He was absolutely passionately invested in television. He was gonna get on television in any way he could find. It didn't matter what other people thought. He just knew what was right and he couldn't explain how he knew it and people started to trust him. I want to be like that. And I also, I, I love the idea of just changing the world just a tiny bit as much as you can. And I love the idea of creatively finding a back door into making your dreams come true. I think I admire that so much. When I first got out of theater school, I didn't have enough life experience to be a good actor, um, which I think is actually a really, really important lesson to learn. If you're so fixated on your passion that you're not getting enough life experience to be able to um, say anything with your passion, um, I think you're doing it wrong. You should be living life. And I really bought into that hustle culture of, I gave up my childhood, my teens and my 20s. I didn't do anything and I didn't have friends really and I did that by choice. I did nothing but work every moment of every day and I wasn't a very good actor. Uh, luckily I like doing other things, but I didn't have anything to draw on. If I could go back and do it differently, I know now that that's the wrong thing to do to myself. Not only have I given myself a physical disability from doing, giving myself that much pressure and that much stress, I would have had more things to make art about and I would have learned more from other artists. One of the reasons I love immersive theater is that there's a really unique way to tackle every single project and that's nice for my brain. So every time we start in a new immersive show and we, whoever my collaborators are at the time, I get to devise a new way of scripting the show and I love doing that. So the first thing with immersive theater is figuring out how all of the actors will know where to be at any given time. Is it watches? Is it a playlist? And you go from there and so maybe the script will look like a spreadsheet maybe the script will be 300 pages long you never know and I adore that I adore that aspect and I work really hard as well to find a way to be critical of media without being hateful and I think it's very easy to slip into parody mocking something I don't think people like watching people be mean for two hours and I don't think people like watching their favorite things eviscerated even if they have if they're outdated or problematic the jokes do come first in that context because I want to make sure that they're kind and then I will layer hard on top of that my favorite thing I ever created was a deeply deeply personal immersive show called Alice in Glitterland and it's it's based on Alice in Wonderland and it's the story of Alice in Wonderland loosely set in a retro cabaret with the themes of not being ready yet to be adult. But not just adult making decisions, adult being sexual, adult uh, being brave. It explores themes of how abuse will change you and how if you are not ready to be in the wide world that you won't notice it happening to you and that you can always choose to leave a situation. Um, and it's it's beautiful and rainbow and joyful and is not depressing, but it was a show about things that I needed to hear. And um, I kind of, I think I sort of therapized myself in the course of writing that and realized that I can leave any situation I'm uncomfortable in in my entire life. And I had to write a whole play to give my permission, myself permission to do that. So very, very special to me. Because everything's happening concurrently and the audience members are um, exploring a sandbox. There are 97 individual discoverable scenes in Alice in Glitterland in 70 minutes. So it's an enormous undertaking to put it on. So my philosophy of dramaturgy and um, my favorite do dramaturg, uh, well, I have two, Kathleen Flaherty and Melanie Yates, both from the um, Playwright Theater Center, they have a philosophy of asking questions. And to me, that is the best way to ever give anyone notes in any context that isn't directly, oh, hey, like, uh, to make that joke land, stand three feet to your right, whatever. But when we're talking about creativity, I know what my story is. So I don't want someone to tell me a different way that my story should be. I want them to ask me questions so my story can, like, blossom. There's so many key pieces of advice. Um, and I think my, my favorite one that I live by is blowing out someone else's candle won't make yours burn brighter. Learn to communicate. 
If you're a person who can't communicate your feelings masked down, you are not going to go far in this business. You have to be able to say when you're uncomfortable. You have to be able to be um, polite and gracious about receiving feedback and criticism, even if you don't agree with it, because unfortunately that is the nature of the business. And the business needs to change. The show business in its entirety needs to change, but it is what, what it is. So in order to create change, we have to uh, sort of, I think, enter the system and start, you know, extending fingers of change upwards. So learn to communicate, learn to play the game of change through diplomacy. No one at the highest levels in this profession are jealous. They are focused on themselves. And I think that's really, really important. And I mean, my own advice is get life experience. So you have stories to tell. <laughs>